I'm going to be talking to Glenn Hodgson, who is a <laughs> fellow in residence at the C.D. Howe Institute, and he co-authored an intelligence memo titled, The Oil Patch is Gushing Money, Where's the Boom? So welcome to the interview, Glenn. Great to be with you again. Well, Glenn, this is, like, I've, I've I've covered the oil and gas industry for years. I generally, you know, I read all of the, the most of the economists who are writing uh, about the industry. Your intelligence memo is the first one that makes the argument that the Canadian oil and gas industry is preparing for a shrinking global oil market. And it's changing the way, what it does with its revenues and the investment patterns and the impact that that has on the Alberta economy. Why don't you run us through kind of the, give us a brief overview of the argument in the memo. Okay, quite happy to do that. So you, as Albertans know, anybody in Alberta knows that it's been a boom bust economy for probably 50 years now. I mean, back to probably the 1970s. We've seen booms and busts of the 80s and 90s. We saw it during the global financial crisis. We saw it when oil prices went down in what, 2015? And recovered a bit. So this is not new, writing about boom bust in Alberta. What's different this time is that we're actually not seeing the boom. So what's happening right now with, with very high oil and gas prices caused largely by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That happened over the last year. What normally happens then is you get this great gush of revenues flowing through the province, revenues both through the firms, also to the provincial government. You know, their royalties go way up. And in fact, on the provincial side, we're seeing we would have seen a surplus of maybe as high as $13 billion this year, if not for the spending to give people relief on inflation. So the gush is happening in terms of public resources, but in terms of how oil firms themselves are managing the cash, they're basically not investing in, in, uh, in future expansion right now. Instead, they're, they're flowing the money back to, to shareholders. So the money is exiting the province. That means you're not having the big sort of boom in, in investment would normally occur in Alberta during, during high oil prices. And as a consequence, Alberta's performance last year was kind of average. It was actually, in fact, if I go back to 2021, Alberta was below the national average in terms of economic growth. Uh, 2022, we won't have the numbers for some time, but I expect Alberta will be kind of at the national average. Um, and other, by the way, other oil producing provinces are even weaker. So if you look at the growth in Saskatchewan and Newfoundland, you're actually seeing even lower rates of growth. So the bottom line is high oil prices usually mean this gush of revenues for both the oil producers and for the government. This time it's not happening. The money's actually flowing out to shareholders and there's no boom as a consequence. It feels good because that was part of the recovery from COVID, but it feels the same as it would in Ontario, Quebec or BC. Now, I want to make an important point here in that the where the uh, companies are investing, uh, it, and you make the, I guess you make this point in the intelligence memo, they're investing in efficiency. They're investing to lower their production costs. And one of the big ways they're doing it is switching to, uh, they're digitalizing their operations. They're using digital technology to replace workers. So in fact, not only is Alberta not having a boom, but in the oil and gas industry, particularly in the service sector, there's this huge drop off in jobs and that's going to uh, forecast to continue for the next decade or more. Yeah, they're, they're really behaving like, a, you know, we, we talked about this earlier, like a mature industry. So mature industries kind of see the peak in their demand, see the peak in their business model, and they do everything they can to improve profitability by boosting their productivity by investing in things that make, makes them much more efficient internally. And the switch from people to digitization is part of that, that evolution. So let's talk about the, the, uh, the volume of money that's flowing out of the, out of the province. So uh, revenue soar to more than $12 billion a month in 2022. Prices have since come down. But we're, yep. we're you know, over the, from now until 2030, there are all kinds of forecasters like uh, Wood McKenzie is one of my favorites, you know, who argue that chronic underinvestment in oil and gas exploration and production will keep prices high, probably well over $65, $70 uh, for the rest of the decade. And then we see forecasters like the International Energy Agency saying that we can expect peak oil demand that's, you know, around 2030, and then a decline beginning in the in the 2030s. That's really the scenario that these companies are planning for, isn't it? 
Yeah, so I'll start with prices. So forecasting oil prices for me is a mugs game. I mean, frankly, nobody's done it accurately over the last 30 years because there's so many factors at play. There is global supply, there's geopolitics, there's one-off events like the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, really, really hard to predict. Of course, warm, warm winter right now occurring in Europe. So gas demand in Europe is nowhere near as strong. Oil demand is, is falling off because of all the things you're doing to regulate prices. So I, I don't even try and forecast prices. You know, I was a forecaster for 12 years at the Conference Board of Canada before I, I retired and joined CD Howe. Um, and uh, we basically assumed today's price was the price going forward because we didn't have a better estimate of prices. But you're absolutely right. There's lots of factors at play. But the structural change you've talked about is also really important. The fact that a lot of forecasters around the world are trying to get a handle on the relationship between climate change, the climate transformation and what it can, it's going to mean for oil demand. And I'm glad you mentioned the International Energy Agency. I've been following them very closely for probably five or six years now. And they finally got smart about three years ago. They stopped doing one forecast because it was always wrong. They were all, their forecast for oil demand was always too strong. They had to keep ratcheting it back year by year. So they've gone to a scenario approach where they're actually doing three scenarios where they're assuming kind of a baseline. Uh, they're assuming the, the, countries actually implement all their climate policies and then they have another scenario of getting to net zero in 2050. And under that, the oil demand could peak as early as 2025 in their sort of climate policy scenario, or it's gonna to plateau into about 2030. But that's the kind of world that oil producers are living in right now. They're, they're actually looking down the field and seeing kind of a, a plateauing in overall demand. And clearly that's influencing their thinking right now. Okay, so they're they're allocating money away from investment in Alberta. They're giving it to uh, shareholders, which yeah, by and large, York, but, in yeah, New York, but, or Toronto, London, exactly right. So uh, I've seen estimates that seventy five percent of shareholders in oil, Canadian oil and gas, are actually uh, outside of the country. So you and I've seen make, like that around eighty as high as eighty percent for some firms. And you make the point that uh, producer revenues used for dividends and share buybacks has nearly tripled in the last few years. Can you explain that? Yeah, it was, so with my co-author, Charles Centrano, who, by the way, Alberta-based at, at Credit Union Central, uh, we did a comparison of, uh, of how revenues were being allocated in 2015, the last time the prices dropped, and then the recovery and today. And it's clear that firms are now allocating much less to investment and much more to keeping shareholders happy. So they're increasing dividends, they're doing share buybacks. I've actually had a chance to see some other analysis in the intervening period since we wrote this back in mid-December. Mid and it's interesting, so the guys on the investment side who look at the supply side factors say that the rate of return for firms is much higher through share buybacks than it is to actually investing in new, in new stock if you have a massive uncertainty as to what prices and volumes are going to be going forward. So on the supply side, as well as the demand side, which you already talked about, there's a lot of factors driving firms to sort of reallocate their money towards keeping shareholders happy, acting like a mature company, rather than acting like a sort of growing risk-taking company going forward. Well, let's talk about some of the potential explanations. And I think we agree that it's this, you know, we, we, the, what the, they're doing is acting, they're, the rational actors, they see their uh, market about to shrink in, the, in what for the oil industry is a very short period of time. Seven years is not much for a planning yeah. horizon. So they see, but there are other potential explanations and we see some of this out and we see it in political discourse, we see it in the media. So let's start with the first one. And that is that this is, the numbers reflect a temporary adjustment due to the, the, wind, the, the windfall in oil revenues. Can you explain yep. that, please? Yeah, very, very simple. If you don't think that prices are going to stay at 80 or $100 a barrel going forward, and clearly they've adjusted just in the last what, month to six weeks, so prices have actually dropped, you don't make long-term commitments as an organization. You treat it as a windfall, as a temporary thing. Um, you don't invest in, in new, new productive stock going forward. You simply give it back to your shareholders. So that's kind of the first and easiest explanation. And again, we're seeing firms in Houston, in the Middle East, doing the same thing. There's actually a lot of evidence that the American oil companies are doing the same thing. They're not investing in massive increases 
in their productive capacity and conventional, uh, they're giving it back to shareholders. So that's explanation number one. Shall I go on to number two? Please do. Yeah, number two is basically barriers, regulatory barriers to increase production. And a lot of Alberta-based commentary has, has focused on things like the role of regulatory barriers, the inability to actually get things built on time, whether it's pipelines or new productive capacity. Um, you, can, you can think about all the things that get in the way of a productive investment. And I think that there's, there's some credence there. I think increasingly we're understanding that our regulatory framework for new projects of any type is probably too tight. It's almost impossible to get a project to the finish line in a realistic time frame. You know, you think about Trans Mountain. I did some work on Trans Mountain eight years ago <laughs> when I was still employed. And it took the federal government intervening, buying the asset. They still have to get it through the CR review process. And ironically, another one of my former employers, EDC, is providing the financing now. But, you know, a 10 year timeline to get things done is just too long. So that's a logical explanation, but it's probably not complete enough. It's probably not a complete explanation which is why we focused on, on, the, on the third option in terms of explanations, which is there's something structural happening, both in terms of supply conditions, but also demand conditions. That's causing oil producing firms to kind of rethink their business model and think about allocating the, the gush of revenues that they're experiencing right now. I always push back on the importance that is uh, given to regulatory uncertainty. And I'll tell you why, Glenn. One is, uh, you know, Kevin Byrne at IHS Market, for example, who follows the uh, oil sands quite closely, says that there's plenty of pipeline capacity up into at least 2030. Uh, the industry itself has other options. It has, it could invest in partial upgrading to take diluent out of the dill bit so that it frees up pipeline capacity. Uh, yeah. And in terms of regulatory delays, uh, the industry moved already three or four years ago away from big green field uh, investments into what are called brownfield investments. So you take an existing field, you take exi uh, an existing uh, facility, like in the oil sands, for example, and you expand that. It's much less capital intensive. It gets your oil to market much quicker. And there probably won't be any more greenfield investments at all. That's where the federal government plays a role. The federal government plays a very small role in, or if not, if any at all, on brownfield investments. And a lot of this takes place, a lot of the approvals take place in, in the province where they don't have a, you know, the Alberta Energy Regulator uh, pretty much approves most of their, their applications. So while it makes for good rhetoric, I really don't think in the grand scheme of things that the, the, uh, the regulatory uncertainty is as limiting a factor as the industry. It's not the industry status quo. I'll give you that. This is not, it's more difficult than it was over the last 50 years, but that's true even in the United States. So yeah, those are anyway, that's arguments. my point. Yeah, that's no, those are all good arguments. And that's part of the reason why we didn't focus on regulatory barriers as the, the explanation. I mean, there's the, the, the industry is a very complex industry. There's many, many factors at play. Regulation is clearly a factor. But as you point out, if you're, you're looking at in-province production, it's uh, uh, AER that does the approvals, not CER. Now, let's talk about the implications for the Alberta economy, because I hate to break it to Albertans, but this is... This is the beginning of a trend. I mean, this trend has actually been going on for uh, a number of years, but uh, we're, hopefully now we're actually beginning to talk about it in public. And if if the province, if the you know the business community doesn't do something about it, uh, is it not a fair argument to say that it's likely the Alberta economy will suffer, incomes will suffer, uh, unemployment might go up? Is that a reasonable scenario? It's a reasonable scenario if people do nothing. So if nothing happens, if people sort of don't change their behavior, change their mindset, you're right, there'll be an impact. I mean, Albertans, Albertans have the highest per capita income in Canada by far, like a third higher than in Ontario, where I live. And if you do nothing and your, your dominant market starts to plateau and then even curve down, um, you're right, there'll be an impact on jobs, on incomes and all those things. The good news is there's a very healthy dialogue in Alberta about diversification that's been going on for at least a decade now. 
you know, I, I've never lived in the province, but I used to be there 10 or 12 times a year. And I had a lot of contact with downtown Calgary, with downtown Edmonton, with the chambers in both city, for example. And they've both been pursuing diversification, uh, income deepening strategies for a long time now. The, the most recent um, uh, immigration numbers show that Alberta's actually, or census numbers show that Alberta is still attracting more people than anybody else in the country. So people still see massive opportunity in Alberta, but maybe not working in the oil and gas sector, maybe doing things like uh, intellectual property development, AI development. And, and I, I'm really, I, I'm almost struck by the energy and the enthusiasm and the sort of go-to spirit that you get in Alberta compared to a lot of other places. And I think if there's any one place in the country that's going to get through the, the transformation and still have high in incomes, it's going to be Al Alberta. Just look at the comments coming from the business leadership in Edmonton and Calgary. And you can see that kind of, they're aware that tr transition is going on, but they're also on top of the file. Well, let me uh, provide a counter argument to that. Uh, and it has several parts. One of them is that Calgary will do very well. Calgary uh, has a very innovative uh, business community. The tech community there is expanding in a wide variety of subsectors like biotech and ag tech and fintech and, and so on. And that will, that will provide some of those high paying technical jobs that Albertans have come to realize. Edmonton, which is more of the manufacturing center, is somewhat less certain. Uh, but Al Edmonton is organizing and, and, and you know, it, it's fair, you could, fair argument that Edmonton will adapt well. It's outside of the two big cities that's going to be the big problem. Now, if you look at the, uh, the there are certainly uh, smaller communities, you know, the 5,000 uh, uh, population of 5,000 like Tabor and Wainwright and Devon and places like that. That's where a lot of that oil and gas service sector was a, a pillar of the economy. And those are the jobs that are disappearing. And in, and then there's the supply chain. There's a lot of companies in Alberta that, that service uh, both conventional and the oil sands. They're going to be impacted. Uh, so I'm, I'm not nearly as in, uh, optimistic about this. And one of the reasons, Glenn, is because the discourse around this transition is not very healthy. Yes, there are, you know, in the business community, as you point out, people are talking about energy transition, but a lot of it is dominated by fighting with the federal government over these phantom issues like regulatory uncertainty and trying to kill the oil and gas industry. Instead of the province having a robust discourse, a conversation about where global markets are going, where energy markets are going, and how to take advantage of the many opportunities that are being provide, uh, being presented by the clean energy industrialization and, and investment that you see in the US and Europe and in China, Japan, Korea. That's the conversation that needs to take place. So I agree with you, it's not an unmitigated disaster, but I'm not as optimistic as you are, I'm afraid. Well, I, I know Calgary best from my business experience in the province. And, you know, I, and I've had a lot of discussion with the chamber and with the Calgary Economic Development over the years. And I, I am pretty certain that Calgary is going to make as smooth a transition as, as possible. You know, look at the transition that happened in the Rust Belt in the United States as a reference point. Pittsburgh has done exceptionally well. Cleveland's been a disaster or, or Gary Andy. And you can think of lots of places. So it really comes down to local strategies, local leadership, local vision. Uh, in terms of what you could be as opposed to getting stuck in the in the present or the past. I often use uh, the stages of grieving as a reference point in terms of how ready people are to have that conversation. And you're right, I think there's a lot of people who are still in kind of the denial anger phase as opposed to bargaining and sort of acceptance and beginning to transition. And that becomes very personal. You know, that's a personal thing in terms of the, the attitude of leaders in any community, workers in any community and, and their willingness. But you, you know, you have local knowledge that I don't have, so I'll defer to you on that. Well, you know, this is all. Uh, this is my take on things, uh, and I will. I think we both agree that this is going to be uh, a structural change in the Alberta economy that will cause some pain, and the opportunity is there for, particularly to Calgary and Edmonton, uh, to 
you know, make the transition as painlessly and maybe even come out to be more prosperous on the other side than they were during the oil and, and gas uh, boom and bust days. That's that's always, I mean, there is a, 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 a scenario that one can imagine where it would actually be an improvement uh, in the Alberta economy. But we're we'll no see. less prosperous at least. That's right. And, but the next seven years, I think, are going to be absolutely critical of the decisions that are made, the investment de decisions that are made. And we'll see how that plays out because it's still very uncertain, uh, I think. But anyway, Glenn, thank you very much for this fascinating uh, uh, interview and, and conversation. We'll look forward to the next one. Well, it was a pleasure as always. And I do look forward to the next one as well.